Halley's Comet, that strange messenger from outer space, can only be seen from Earth once in every 76 years. It was due to reappear in 1986. This time was different. For this time, as Halley visited us, we were visiting Halley. Edmund Halley, the astronomer, started unraveling the mystery of this comet nearly three centuries ago. Now these secrets will be finally surrendered. Comet science has a long history. The record starts in China, where observational astronomy was developed over 2,500 years ago. The passage of comets was carefully recorded in the Qin Shu Chronicles. In the third century before Christ, the Chinese emperor had destroyed most of the records. Fortunately, one of the remaining chronicles does mention a comet in 240 BC, and counting backwards from 1986, that fits in with Halley's 76-year apparition. This is the first certain record of Halley's comet. Halley's next return in 164 BC was not recorded in the Chronicles or anywhere else. Or so it seemed until the study of Babylonian tablets in the British Museum in 1984 surprised even the experts. The story of the comet starts here in a Panima, in a Haran Shut Anim, in a Kaka Mumuli Guana. The gap in 23 centuries of record was filled. Halley reappeared in 684 AD and the event was recorded 800 years later in the Nuremberg Chronicles. Comets meant ill over. For the English of 1066, Halley was also an omen. The Bayer Tapestry says they wonder at the star. Bad news for Harold, he lost his throne. In 1301, Giotto di Bondone saw the comet and used it as a model for his star of Bethlehem. Could Halley have appeared at Christ's birth? No, that's just artistic license. Four centuries after Giotto, Edmund Halley's name became linked forever to the comet. At the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, Halley held the prestigious post of Astronomer Royal in the early 18th century. It was in 1680 that he became fascinated by comets. He was convinced all comets travelled in straight lines, shooting across the sky, never to be seen again. Two years later, he changed his mind. He'd been collecting observations on 24 comets and applying Newton's new law of gravitation, Halley realized that comets could not travel in straight lines. The young astronomer saw that comets must fly in curves, a parabola or perhaps an ellipse, pulled off the straight by the gravity of the sun. His calculations led him to a conclusion even more amazing. He realized that the comet he'd studied in 1682 followed the same path as one picturesquely recorded 76 years before. And yet another 76 years before that. He'd never lived to see it, but when he published his tables, Halley wrote, I would venture confidently to predict the comet's return in 1758. Throughout that year, astronomers searched the skies in vain. Then, on Christmas night, the comet at last made its triumphant return. Its next visit, in 1835, was studied and drawn by the French astronomer Arago. And by the German, Schwaber. Astronomers still had to record observations with sketches. It was only in 1910 that photography was available. That year, Halley caused a sensation. For 
purveyors of ill omen had a field day. By the 1980s, things were less fanciful. Modern telescopes picked out Halley in 1982, a mere dot in the sky. By November 1985, the dot had grown into a large smudge ringed by a hazy cloud. Now the target was in sight for the encounter. Now the prediction of the great pioneers of comet science could be put to the test. Where do comets come from? Why do they behave so oddly? What can they tell us of the origins of our universe? Kepler thought there were as many comets in the sky as fishes in the sea. Jan Oort of Leiden in Holland thinks Kepler may have underestimated. Oort developed a theory that comets rained down upon us from some vast icy reservoir. A great cloud of comets orbiting the sun far out beyond the planets. If one computes the orbits with great accuracy, one sees uh, that these comets come from very large distances of the order of 50,000 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun, 50,000 astronomical units. But how many comets are there in the Oort cloud? Well, I wish I knew, but there must be something of the order of uh, 100,000 uh, million comets. Or 100 billion, as the Americans would say. <laughs> Halley's Comet is one of those billions that became detached from the Oort cloud eons ago, perhaps dispatched by a passing star. It came into our solar system and was attracted by the gravitational pull of the giant planets. As Halley goes into its elliptical orbit around the Sun, the famous tail is formed. Comet tails had been studied since the Middle Ages. Long ago, it was noted that they always streamed away from the sun. It wasn't until the 1950s that a German astrophysicist made the connection between the direction of a comet's tail and an outflow from the sun. Ludwig Biermann had to wait until the American space program for confirmation. At this point, I thought this was a, a rather striking uh, confirmation in favor mm, uh, that this picture that the plasma tails were driven by a very tiny outflow which is a co co solar corona um, and the one uh, was convinced practically everybody uh, was the finding by uh, the u.s spacecraft mariner 2 on his flight uh, to Venus and Pick. So Biermann's solar wind blew a comet's tail always away from the sun. What about the comet? Does it have a solid nucleus? For a long time it was thought that the nucleus was made up of loosely adhering gravel. Then in 1950, Fred Whipple saw this gravel bank theory must be wrong. At that time I began to realize that the theory just could not be valid. There was uh, no way in which uh, comets could last long enough. I'd been studying meteors, and particularly Enki's comet, which moves in a very short orbit, and uh, three and a third years, the shortest period. And I discovered that that comet had been around making hundreds, if not thousands, of revolutions. Now, uh, comets give off a lot of gas, and uh, uh, carbon compounds, and uh, oxygen, hydrogen, and so forth. And uh, uh, this amounts to tons per second lost by a large comet. If not gravel, perhaps ice. Whipple suggested the nucleus might be formed of dust held together by ice, like some giant dirty snowball. Each time a comet orbited the sun, Whipple argued, tons of this dirty ice would be drawn off and stream away in the solar wind. This means the dirty snowball nucleus gets smaller with each orbit. So how much do astronomers really know about a comet's anatomy? The theory is that as Whipple's dirty snowball nears the sun, it's heated. 
the molecules within it are sublimated and pour forth from the nucleus, forming an atmosphere of gas and dust called the coma. The neutral particles in the coma, in turn, interact with Biermann's solar wind, becoming electrically charged, producing the ion, or gas tail. This is straight and narrow and flows directly away from the sun. The cometary dust particles behave differently. They move more slowly, lagging behind the position of the comet, and are pushed away from the sun by radiation pressure. The dust tail is curved and broad. These tails spread out for millions of kilometers. Some comets are surrounded by vast clouds of hydrogen. Some comets disintegrate dramatically. In 1976, Comet West broke into four, with each segment developing its own tail. In 1910, Halley itself displayed a lengthening tail until the middle of May, then, later, as the comet moved away from the sun, the tail died away. All this, astronomers have observed from a distance of many million kilometers. Now, for the first time, they can test the theories and study the comet at close range to find out what it's made of, what its rotation period is, and how it interacts with the space surrounding it. Halley's Comet was chosen because of its high activity and predictable orbit. This is Giotto, the spacecraft conceived by the European Space Agency for its first deep space mission. It's designed to spin through space once every four seconds on its long journey. The delicate craft is named after the Italian master painter so inspired by Halley six centuries before. Today's Giotto is an example of space-age craftsmanship built by the European Star Consortium led by British Aerospace. Solar panels power Giotto for the journey of over 700 million kilometers. In the fuel tanks is hydrazine for the thruster motors to make in-flight course adjustments. Giotto is a sophisticated, compact spacecraft standing three meters from base to antenna tip. In the middle of the spacecraft is a rocket motor to fire it out of Earth's orbit. The structure consists of three platforms topped by a tripod. Two dust shields protect Giotto and its 11 scientific experiments. Under the tripod, radio antennae to beam data back to Earth. And Giotto was not alone in the quest for Halley. It was the most ambitious of an international fleet of spacecraft. In December 1984, the Russians launched their Vega probes. There were two of them, targeted to pass at under 10,000 kilometers from Halley, making their own observations and also acting as pathfinders for Giotto. Halley's orbit was well known, but positioning Giotto in relation to it was no easy matter. The Vegas flew by first and detected the comet's nucleus. The Americans tracked the Vega signals, thanks to the coordination of the interagency consultative group, and the combination of these data improved Giotto's positioning by a factor of 10. Japan also had two spacecraft set to monitor the comet's vast ultraviolet corona. The instruments of the two Japanese probes were designed for a missed distance of 150,000 and 7 million kilometers. Five probes in all, forming the armada that went to greet Halley in early March 86. First Vega 1 on the 6th, then Suisse on the 8th, Vega 2 on the 9th, and Sakigaki on the 11th. And finally, on the 14th, Giotto targeted much closer at under 1,000 kilometers. Darmstadt, West Germany, the European Space Agency's operation center. The Giotto mission has been planned for five years. 
the mission's project scientist is Rudiger Reinhardt. And I looked at it and... Uh, Reinhardt held regular sure meetings with the principal investigators and, and the 130 I scientists involved with the experiments on board Giotto. The words were chosen so wisely that whatever we do, the scientific objectives will be fulfilled. These are the 11 international science teams who study Halley. The nucleus, the gases, the dust, the magnetic forces, the complex chemistry. And since comets are thought to preserve materials from the dawn of the solar system, the scientists hope to find clues to its formation. Tony MacDonald leads a British experiment called the Dust Impact Detector. MacDonald's team tested the detector system that was fitted aboard Giotto. Giotto's leading surface is a dust shield of aluminium, with sensors to record the impact of particles colliding at speeds 50 times faster than a bullet speeds too high to be reproduced reliably on Earth. He tested the system as far as was possible with tiny glass beads to see if the sensors were working. Miniature microphones recorded the impacts, telling McDonnell how large those impacting particles were and where they hit the shield. Giotto carried other experiments to study the plasma surrounding Halley, the hot ionized gases swirling around the comet. The, the main difference between these two is for NMS, the NMS bake out, which shows that basically NMS baking out is about 10 degrees. Hans Balsiger leads the Swiss experiment from Bern University, measuring ions in Halley's coma. Yeah. Yeah. The ion mass spectrometer on the side of the spacecraft was designed to measure Halley's charged atoms and molecules. They're first repelled in an electrostatic field and then deflected by a curved magnet onto a target plate. Where they fall on the plate reveals their mass and their mass tells you what they are. Oxygen, for instance, is mass 16, water mass 18. The elbow-shaped particle impact analyzer from Germany's Max Planck Institute was designed to measure incoming dust particles. They smash onto a target with such force that they are vaporized and ionized. These ions are accelerated into an angled tube, the lightest arriving first, so their flight time identifies what they are. The earliest hydrogen, the middle oxygen, and the last silicon, for example. The scientists want to know how Halley's ionosphere interacts with the solar wind plasma in which it's embedded. Would the solar wind be slowed down, deflected and heated by the comet? Alan Johnson heads the team from University College London. His experiment measures the energy distribution of the solar wind plasma from which its velocity, temperature and density can be derived. It consists of a voltage generator and plates across which its electrical voltage is applied together with a particle detector. Ions stream into the instrument and curve towards the detector but only those with the correct energy pass between the plates and reach the detector. Ions entering from a different direction emerge at a different position. At the meeting, they discussed Giotto's flyby distance. It's critical and the subject of intense discussions. There are two main camps. The chemists who want to fly as close as possible to know Halley's composition, even risking the spacecraft. And there's the imaging team, whose instrument was designed for a flyby distance of no less than 500 kilometers. Uwe Keller heads the Halley Multicolor Camera, or HMC team. We've heard of HMC's difficulties if we would fly very close to the nucleus. And they said that they would indeed prefer to fly by at a distance of 1,000 kilometers, which most of the other PIs didn't like 
some PIs didn't care one way or the other. It does not make any sense to talk about details where you want to point if you have an uncertainty of one thing about 1,000 kilometers. And then you have a good chance to fly by 1,000 kilometers. This is a reasonable good number, even if you point at the nucleus. And I think this is the background to the whole thing. No, no, Uwe, the 500 kilometers was generated because you said, I do not want to fly closer than 500. That's why. Keller's multicolor camera is the most spectacular of Giotto's experiments. It will provide a continuous stream of pictures throughout the encounter. It is Giotto's eye, giving scientists the chance to see the nucleus, to establish its size and the nature of its surface. It's unique. It has been developed to rotate to take pictures both ahead and behind as the spacecraft skims close by but the rotation speed of the camera makes it impossible to track with the comet if the flyby distance is less than 500 kilometers. Incoming light is reflected from a steel mirror into a small telescope. The image is then focused onto a charge coupled device. And this will obtain pictures of the comet in four separate colors. From 500 kilometers away, the camera should see objects a mere 11 meters across on the comet's surface. With such a lot at stake, it's hardly surprising they're reluctant to take risks. The high-gain antenna dish will point constantly towards Earth as Giotto itself spins through space. It's this dish that will beam radio signals back continuously as Giotto passes through Halley's coma. April 1985, Toulouse, France. Giotto was loaded aboard a special flight. Destination, Kourou in French Guiana. To the east lies the infamous Devil's Island. To the south, the capital, Cayenne. The Guiana Space Center is the launch site for Europe's Ariane rockets. Now the race is on to make sure Giotto stays on schedule for the rendezvous. As soon as the spacecraft is unpacked, every part is thoroughly checked and tested. Launch day had been set for Tuesday, July the 2nd. They have 10 weeks to be ready. If they miss that deadline, the whole encounter with Halley could be jeopardized. Ah, oh, stop. Too far. Back again. A laser ensures that the stop. thruster motors are in line, essential for the delicate in-flight course adjustments. It's these thrusters that must stop. steer stop. and that's control it. Giotto that's through it. space. Okay, that's fine. Meanwhile, Giotto's experimental scientists gather in Kourou. Four German experiments, two French, two British, one Swiss and one Irish are now safely aboard. Tuesday, June the 25th, 1985, Giotto is transported to the launch site. Dawn over Devil's Island. Giotto, the spacecraft, is now to be joined with the Ariane rocket that will carry it on its journey to Halley. Giotto is hoisted nearly 50 meters into the nose cone. Weather in Kourou, even in midsummer, can be unpredictable, and the forecast is not encouraging. But from now on, the engineers and scientists will be working through the night if Giotto is to leave on time. June the 30th, launch minus two days. Both Ariane and Giotto have been armed for liftoff. The long countdown procedure starts tonight. Launch day minus one. The blockhouse, the bunker where the Ariane crew is sealed in. It's only 200 meters from the rocket itself. Hazardous fuel filling operations of the launch vehicle are completed. They're about halfway through the countdown 
The gantry has been withdrawn. Ariane is ready to go. Twelve kilometers away is the mission control center. For the launch itself, the spacecraft engineers and those with experiments on board must consign their project to the launch team. Now Giotto's project manager, Dave Dale, can only wait. Liftoff is set at 13 minutes past eight, and there are special guests to see it. Professor Hira from the Japanese mission. Plus 3,4 seconds, l'ouverture décrochée. Five past eight, Suivi and green décollage. status for all systems. Giotto is switched to her onboard batteries. Les paramètres et les mesures sont actuellement correctes. Attention, bourrage zéro. Final arming, ready to go. Les derniers armements ont lieu en ce moment. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. Ignition. Allian first stage ignition and take off. Take off and décollage. First stage flight. Début des manœuvres de roulis. à environ 297 km euh, des côtes de Guyane. Nous entendons actuellement en centre de contrôle euh, les bruits, le bruit Alors, du, de propulsion en haute trajectoire normale. Euh, les indications de la télémesure sont tout à fait correctes. Safely on course. Watchers receive their first signals from Giotto. The spacecraft camera filmed the Earth from 21 million kilometers out in space. The false colors show degrees of light intensity. These pictures were taken as a camera test in October 1985. Another two hours later shows the Earth's rotation. With the continents outlined, Australia emerges centre screen. These are remarkable pictures and make the prospect for filming Halley on March the 14th very exciting. International cooperation is the keynote of the Halley mission. Major observatories are coordinated by the International Halley Watch to collect and distribute data. Mount Palomar, California. The European Southern Observatory, La Silla, Chile. On Hawaii, the Canada, France, and UK Infrared Telescope. Kitt Peak, Arizona. The Anglo-Australian Telescope, Siding Spring, Australia. All of them watching and waiting for March 86, when encounter would take place. The first was Vega, flying at a distance of 9,000 kilometers. It was damaged by surprisingly large amounts of dust destroying 40% of its solar panels. It was a successful mission and sent back these pictures showing what could be the nucleus cocooned in dust. On March the 8th and 11th, the two Japanese probes flew by, much further out. Suisse had a positive ion analyzer on board to detect the solar wind and cometary ions. It also carried an ultraviolet imager to study the hydrogen corona. It had been observing for four months prior to encounter, and from these results, scientists accurately calculated the rotation period of the comet as 52.9 hours. Halley was very active, and Suisse was also hit by the dust. Vega 2 made its pass at 8,000 kilometers. Dust damaged 80% of its solar array, and its pictures showed what looked like a double nucleus. The first impression is that uh, Vega 1 uh, and Vega 2 uh, had encountered different comets. The reason uh, why it's so, uh, uh, we have confirmation from different experiments that comet was much more active during uh, the first encounter. It was much more dusty. 
Was it disappointing to have suffered so much dust damage? We certainly have lost a uh, few experiments and uh, we have lost uh, more than 50% uh, of solar panels. But still it's okay. I think in principle we were ready for kamikaze mission. And uh, uh, my personal judgment was that uh, we were very lucky to come in such uh, a condition. It uh, gives a very good uh, hope for Jota to go through at much closer distance and to be alive. The following day, the Giotto scientists met. They had to agree the target distance, bearing in mind how much Vega had been troubled by dust. I, mean, I think the dust doing here is very good, and I am not so much afraid about the spacecraft. Much more Balancing the differing the needs and scientific and objectives of the various experiments like was not easy. This point around the table is that yeah, we should yeah. not let anyone get the impression that if uh, Giotto is destroyed, the closest approach to an admission was a failure. The science working team recommends to target Giotto at 500 kilometers plus one sigma, which is the targeting uncertainty, which is presently estimated to be about 40 kilometers. The decision was taken. That evening, the last orbit correction maneuver was made. Giotto would fly at a distance of 540 kilometers from Halley's nucleus at three minutes past midnight on the 14th of March. Isak was poised for encounter. Closest approach, Giotto is 8 million kilometers away from Halley in the solar wind. It hasn't experienced the comet, though some of the experiments on board are already working and the results coming through. The Johnson plasma analyzer results show a smooth plasma flow of the solar wind in the bottom panel. It picked up its first signs of the cometary elements on the 12th of March. It appeared rather faint in the top panel. Other experiments are seeing signs of activity. Giotto is heading towards the bow shock of Halley's Comet. This is the area where the cometary atmosphere meets the supersonic solar wind head on. There are only four and a half hours to go before closest approach, and we're just over one million kilometers away. Giotto is leaving the cooler, smooth flowing solar wind and entering the hotter atmosphere of the comet. The magnetometer sees the first clear evidence that a change is taking place. The time is about 7.30. The magnitude begins to increase with strong fluctuations, and at the same time, the JPA experiment can differentiate between cometary and solar wind ions. The cometary ions in the upper panel are accelerating, while the solar wind ones are slowing down, showing a thickening band as they become hotter and denser. At 7.30, the official ESA guests arrive. closest approach. The camera is working well, but it's still too far away to see the nucleus itself.
Giotto is just over a quarter of a million kilometers from the nucleus, and it's just an hour or so before closest approach. The first signs of dust are detected. The DID experiment shows only a thin distribution of impacts, just as expected. The real trouble will come later. A look at the PS spectrum shows the composition of the dust. This particle contains carbon, oxygen, sodium, magnesium, silicon, calcium and iron. While another dust particle shows a different composition. This one is rich in hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. Is this evidence of the existence of simple organic molecules on the comet? Giotto is only 135,000 kilometers from the nucleus and with 33 minutes to encounter. The magnetometer results register a change, showing an increase in the magnetic field. The ion mass spectrometer charts a deceleration in the solar wind ions seen in the upper panel, while in the lower panel at 11.30 it registers a deflection of ions taking place around the comet. Giotto scientists have established that the solar wind behaves like a smooth and fairly fast-flowing river meeting an obstacle placed in its path. Just as the obstacle interferes with the smooth flow of the river, so does the comet interfere with the smooth flow of the solar wind. As the water drapes around the pole, so does the solar wind drape around the comet. An area of water builds up on the upstream side of the pole. The same thing happens to the solar wind upstream of the comet. These magnetometer results show this pile-up region happening. By now, all experiments are working well. No one is disappointed with their results, and Giotto is well on course. Giotto is traveling deeper into the coma. We're 25,000 kilometers away, and it's only six minutes before closest approach. At last, the first images where the nucleus is clearly resolved and the first major surprise. As the raw pictures are enhanced and analyzed, we can see clearly the shape of the nucleus. It's not the sphere that was supposed. It's more like an elongated potato with a very dark surface. We can even measure the dimensions, 15 kilometers high and seven wide. And another surprise, it's much bigger than was thought. And it's very dark, one of the darkest bodies in the solar system. These hot, bright areas are highly active dust jets, pouring out gas at the rate of 16 tonnes per second, equivalent to 50,000 garden hoses at full blast. Only one minute before closest approach, the spacecraft is closing in at 68 kilometres per second. Giotto is entering the contact surface. Once inside, it will sample only the pure atmosphere of the comet. It's the first time a probe has flown so close. The mass spectrometers have detected that 80% of the comet is made up of water ice and that 80% of the gas surrounding the comet is water vapour. Another 10% is a mixture of carbon dioxide, ammonia and methane, while the last 10% is a bit of a mystery. The chemistry is constantly changing, so it's difficult to identify instantly. Once inside the contact surface, another major discovery. There is no magnetic field. The magnitude plunges as Giotto crosses the contact surface. At the same time, the ion temperature dramatically decreases. The ion velocity, previously at around zero, increases to one kilometer per second, indicating the smooth outflow of cometary ions inside the ionosphere. So the higher temperature of the ions outside this zone can be attributed to the interaction of the cometary ions with those from the solar wind. Giotto is nearly there, only 2,000 kilometers away with just 30 seconds before encounter. The DID experiment is registering a battle royal with the dust, detecting 12,000 impacts as Giotto travels towards its target. 
And of course, the imaging team is giving more and more detailed results. Work has begun on enhancing the pictures, and here we see the features emerge. We can identify craters on the nucleus with a diameter of one to one and a half kilometers. It has a much rougher surface than anticipated, showing hills and valleys. And the nucleus is covered with a dark dust crust with fissures in the crust where the jets stream. This sequence of pictures taken by the camera shows what it must have been like to be on board Giotto and closing in on Halley. It looks as if the mission is a success. There will be a celebration. But then, the first signs of trouble. The live pictures on the camera monitors wobble and go to black. The data flow ceases. Something is seriously wrong. ESOC has lost contact with the spacecraft. In mission control, they're trying to isolate the problem and regain control of Giotto. No signals are being received on Earth. One dust particle, weighing only one gram and about the size of a pea, traveling at the speed of a gun blast, had knocked Giotto out of alignment by more than the critical one degree. Signals leaving Giotto were missing Earth. To make matters worse, the particle had gouged a huge hole in the dust shield, causing Giotto to wobble on its own axis. Radio signals were recovered after 20 seconds, but contact was intermittent for half an hour until the wobbles on the spacecraft were damped out some experiments were damaged. Others are still working, even transmitting data on the outward journey. JPA's graph displays remarkable symmetry on the outbound leg, showing a weak bow shock, not as pronounced as on the inward journey. Similarly, the magnetometer experienced a weaker bow shock and the outbound pass gives the impression of a much more gradual decrease in magnitude in the magnetic field. Giotto is now in hibernation, making its journey slowly back to Earth. Has the mission verified the hypotheses of the pioneers? I think it verifies them completely and gloriously myself. I'm delighted with the results. I think that the, the surprise is that the engineers did such a beautiful job and that they received made so many results. I think that was the most surprising part, is a highly successful, uh, high success of so many experiments on this uh, adventure. It's only a small spacecraft, but it has made an incalculable contribution to our understanding of the nature of our universe. Giotto is a mission of which we should be proud. <laughs>